sure the students will take away very valuable life lessons from the interaction that the staff have said today. I would like to thank you, sir, for all kinds of support, encouragement, and guidance to the entire GIS fraternity of students, teachers, and parents for the last few years. Let me share with you what leadership lecture is all about and why we do it and why we shall continue to do it. It started more than a decade ago. Uh, GIS pedagogical model of nine gems uh, framework, which focuses on the holistic development of students and our school's vision to nurture our students as citizens of tomorrow. GIS brings best practices with us today with a promise for tomorrow. We endeavor to instill 21st century skills in our students by emphasizing on our instructional plan that focuses on creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration that prepares them to be students or digital citizens of tomorrow. Under the LLS, we invite leaders from different walks of life to our campuses to interact with our students. They share the stories of failure and success, which motivates our students to learn from them and help shape their future. It's the first time we are having a leadership lecture series, which is a physical event at GIS Tokyo, and that makes it very unique. So today we have a very decorated leader, our own Aftab sir, who will inspire all of us to those who are present in the auditorium and the GIS community at large who have joined us via Zoom with his lecture and words of wisdom. Let's once again give him our GIS welcome. May I invite Aftab sir to join us on the stage and take his seat. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind and impactful words. No, no, I think it's fine here. Then I can move my hand. In speech, um, as much as in life, uh, the hands play a very important part. And when you are on the stage as an actor, or when you are on the screen as a film actor, hands, eyes, your body, language, all these things count in the process of communication. And what I mean to do is to communicate with you. I hope to be able to give you uh, some ideas about what uh, my life has been. And through that, if you can learn one or two things, uh, I'd be very happy. First, let me tell you that I started my connections with this country exactly 60 years ago today. In 1962, many of your parents perhaps had not been born then, but I came as a student from Delhi University, from a college called St. Stephen's, to study for a year in the oldest university of Japan, which is called Keio. Now, Keio was founded in 1858. I'm not going to give you money. I'm going to show you the founder of Kale. Fukuzawa Yukichi. Nyonji no Uzoku Wakaru Kisho. Saying Hapi Ako Goju Hachina in the sense of Sarekan, this name, Kale Taikaku. So, in 1868, this man 
when there was the Meiji, those of you who study history will know, there was a thing called the Meiji Restoration, which put Japan on the path of modernization and brought Japan to where we are today. And this man was not just the founder of Keio University, but the founder of Keio University Press and an advisor to the Meiji government of Japan. He traveled to America and to various other places to convey the message that Japan is a country on the moon. He's regarded as the intellectual father of modern Japan. So I was very privileged 60 years ago to study in this very eminent institution. Um, that was my first visit to this country. Then after joining the Foreign Service in 1968, after studying in Delhi and at Oxford University uh, for a few years, my first posting again was Japan. By the way, when I came in 1962, Japan was preparing for the first Olympics of 1964. So I could see how this society and this government worked in tandem, making the feverish preparations that were required. Building Tokyo Tower, building the Haneda, Hanatsucho, monorail, extending the subway up to Nihonbashi, the Shibuya visa up to Nihonbashi, and so on. Building expressways. By the way, there were no expressways. There was a normal route from Haneda Airport into town. There was no course of road. Okay? All that happened at that time. When I came back to Japan in 1970, um, there was the great exposition in Osaka, Osaka Bampa, uh, which was a very important event. It also brought the whole world into Japan. And those years, the 70s and 80s, saw the rapid, rapid growth of Japan. And I was here in those early years, but let me tell you that Japan was also highly polluted, like my city, Delhi, is today the most polluted city in the world. I'm ashamed to say it. But Tokyo was a very polluted city. You do not realize it now, with your air being so clean as it is. But it was very polluted. The air was very polluted. You couldn't go out. It was so much, there was so much smog. Old people and children were told to stay at home. The waters were polluted. Some factories were putting their poisonous effluents, including mercury, into the rivers. And some people fell ill in a place called Minamata. In fact, it was called Minamata Byo. It was a, a disease which affected the nervous system of a human being. And many people died, many people fell sick. And right till about 10 years ago, they were fighting legal cases to get compensation for the harm that was done to them then. So these, these are the events that I witnessed. Uh, in those early years. And then I came back to Japan after an interval of 28 years in, 19, in, in the year 2000 as ambassador, having been ambassador in several other countries before. But that was my last post as ambassador. And I was fortunate to be able to see and to arrange the 50th anniversary of our diplomatic relations with the India and Japan, which was started in 1952, 10 years before I came to Japan. So I was here on the 10th anniversary in 62, for the 20th anniversary in 1972, and for the 50th in 2008. And we were very honored that the Emperor of Japan, now he's the Emperor Emeritus and Empress Michiko, 
And the crown prince, who is now the emperor in Arupito, and his wife, Masako. All of them and several other members of the imperial family attended events connected with the Christian Empire. I'm telling you this because you must understand the depth of mutual respect that exists between our two countries. It goes back, of course, to history. India has considered ten ten huge, but it, it goes back because we were we were the, responsible for bringing uh, Buddhism to this country. And uh, Shoto Kutaishi uh, did a lot to spread this to all parts of Japan. So apart from that historical context, we have moved from the early part of this century, from the 21st century, to a global part between India and Japan. And when Prime Minister Mori Yoshiro, who is still alive, came to India in August 2000, he and Prime Minister Vajpayee announced this global partnership. And later, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh came here, Shinzo Abe and he, in December 2006, raised this global partnership to a strategic partnership. And this development has led to great cooperation in the field of defense, strategic issues, naval cooperation, uh, cooperation in handling terrorism, international terrorism, and so on. Now, I'm telling you these little stories so that you understand that you are privileged to live in a country and to study and to learn in a country which is very well disposed towards India, the country which is the place of origin for many of the people who are responsible for setting up the Global Schools Foundation and the GIS family in so many countries of the world. You may know, of course, that the GIS exists in several other countries of Southeast Asia and in the Middle East. And we hope that it will also move to other cities in Japan, outside Tokyo. Um, I would like to suggest to you, if I may, that if you would like to ask me anything in connection with what I have said, or anything else that concerns you, concerns your education, concerns your life in Japan, please be feel, uh, feel free to do so. Because I don't want to rant on endlessly and tell you boring stories about my boring life. Who will? Ah, the students are done. So, uh, I, I, sorry, I, I forgot to mention that after I stopped being ambassador, I went back to KO in six years, I was a professor there. So my connections with KO got deeper and deeper, and I became the international advisor, and I linked KO, I must tell you, with 10 of our best institutions in India, including the IIT Bombay, the IIT Kharagpur, the IIT Delhi, and uh, the IIM in, uh, in Bangalore, and the IIM in Calcutta, and the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, and so on. So KO is already linked with several of our top institutions where I hope someday some of you will go and study. And as somebody mentioned, I was a visiting professor at the IIT Bombay for three years. So, uh, are the students coming here? Yeah, come, come, come. And so that I can stop talking. Thank you, sir, for your most valuable and insightful words of wisdom. On behalf of everyone present here, I would like to tell you that your words have really impacted us and you have always amazed and inspired us. Thank you. You're welcome. Come, come. Join me here. Please uh, come. We will now have a student panelist discussion with students from our campus here and from GIS Singapore, Hadapsir, and Hikashi Patai Tokyo. Singapore, Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
My name is Alushi Sai, as you know. I'm from Mindful CBS this campus. Our next question is from BGD from Singapore Smart Campus. Oh, yes. Over to you, BGD Yes. 
I wouldn't be one. They were to ask you, why not put this thing on so that wherever I'm in love with my ears, I can use my eyes. Do you think I could get a bottle of water? Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you. So this is coming from Singapore, G1. Yes, sir. Um, hello, sir. Um, G1. Yeah. Sorry. Um, hello, sir. I'm BG Jeevan, studying in IBA 1. Um, it's a pleasure being able to have a conversation with you, sir. My question to you would be, you have served as an ambassador in different countries and must have worked with different kinds of people. How do you encourage your team in the face of disagreement and adversity? Thank you. That's a very good question, Jeevan. You have a long Jeevan. Because you are a clever human. Um, yes, of course, working in different countries requires number one, one the ability to adapt. You must, all of you, have the ability to adapt. Because each country has its own cultural union, it has its own civilization in past. It has its own language, and each people have their own DNA. All the Japanese students here have the Japanese DNA, and those who are half Japanese will have half Japanese DNA and half something else. So that is what makes up people, right? So you have to learn to adapt. Now, uh, I work with people who speak Arabic, in Cairo, people who speak German in Hamburg, people who speak Bahasa in Indonesia, in Indonesia as they do partly in Singapore, those of Malay origin in Singapore speak Bahasa in Indonesia, they call it Malay, but it's Bahasa in Indonesia. And uh, when I was in Vietnam, people speak Vietnamese, so I made an attempt to learn Vietnamese. When I was in Germany, I made an attempt to learn German. So that is part of the process of adaptation because you can't understand the people well until you learn the language. That was most important. You children here are being taught five languages. Some of you are learning Chinese, some of you are learning Japanese, some of you are learning Sanskrit, some Tamil, some Hindi, some uh, Japanese, of course. So this is a great exposure for you. And you must use these opportunities of learning your languages as thoroughly as you can. And through the language, try and imbibe the culture that that language represents. If it's Chinese, try and acquire something of the flavor of, of China, which includes, of course, a little more than eating Chinese food. I mean, by eating ramen, you can't say that you have acquired a Chinese flavor. Or by eating or soba or gong, you have it, you have actually moved in the direction of acquiring the Japanese flavor. So be adaptive, be flexible. And try to adapt. Now, you when people in your mission, or the people in the ministry that you're working under, uh, could you pass it towards me? Thank you. I can leave it here and hands. Uh, when they disagree with you, what do you do? Yes. The same two values adaptability, flexibility, and compassion. Do not judge. People. I was so impressed when I went to one of the campuses. Everywhere, kindness, kindness, be kind to your. So, you know, this is something that came into Japan also. Chie, wisdom, and G, G, compassion. But this is very important in dealing with differences in the organization that you are working with. You are here, you have differences. 
Someone doesn't like you, he punches you in the nose. That's not the best way of solving our differences. It's much better to be kind and show compassion. Show flexibility. He may not be wrong, maybe you're wrong. So that's the way. Is that all right, Jeeva? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Is, do I answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Yes. I thought I had three ears instead of two. How long do you think the world economies will take to recover from the setback we suffered during the COVID-19 pandemic? How long I am looking into my crystal ball. I don't see an answer. In my crystal ball, I can look into this one. Yeah. But seriously, um, the world economy has done remarkably well, actually, considering that the few years we have lost years. And if it wasn't for Mr. Putin, who went into Ukraine in February, we would have got along much better. This has been a setback. The aggression in Ukraine, and he doesn't call it aggression, but the Ukrainians call it aggression. So that has been a setback. And had it not been for that, the world would have recovered much quicker from the ravages of the COVID pandemic, which um, we've had for the last three years. This has been bad, you know, uh, amongst the biggest grain exporters are uh, Ukraine and Russia, especially Ukraine. And farmers in Japan are suffering. Because they're not getting the corn fields that they normally get need to get from um, from Ukraine, and so the producers of wagyu, you know, uh, wagyu, yes, and uh, <laughs> sorry, I hope that doesn't offend anybody. But wagyu is a great delicacy in Japan, and those farmers, and other farmers who who raise uh, livestock. Are facing great difficulties because of this war. In India, we are facing great difficulties because of the war. We also import a lot of our pulses from uh, other countries. And uh, we are facing the same problem. All of us are facing the problem. So the pandemic, cautiously optimistic, mm. we may not have turned the corner mm. yet. Look what's happening in Hokkaido and then today. It's coming there, it's coming and up in the north, in Ashta and so forth. There are a number of cases in the north, so we have to be careful. But yes, I think cautiously optimistic. If we all take precautions and keep our masks on and sanitize our hands and keep our social distances and keep close. We should be all right. Have no fear. Thank you. If I have survived 80 years, you will survive. <laughs> okay, who's the next one? Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Joanne Manoj from Grade 12 CBSC, and our next question is from Vitisha Huda, studying in GIS Smart Campus, Singapore. Oh, Singapore. Over to Vitisha. Good afternoon, sir. I am Jyotisha Huda, a CBSC student from grade 11. It's an honor to talk to you, sir. You have had the opportunity of visiting many schools and universities around the world. Now learning involves technology. How, according to you, is this new form of learning impactful? Yes, the new form of learning, you mean the, the virtual form of learning, yeah. Let me tell you that after I left KO, 
I became a visiting professor at a university here, set up by a great businessman, former graduate of Harvard Business School, called Kenichi Omai, Omai Kenichi. And he set up a university called the Business Breakthrough University. And I was a visiting professor there for about five, six years. And the learning was entirely virtual, which was quite new for me, because when I was teaching in Keio, there were physical classes, there was no COVID then. And even during the years that I was with the BB team, the Business Breakthrough University, there was no COVID. But the, the, the learning was almost entirely virtual. One or two physical classes when I was in Tokyo, but I could be sitting in Delhi or anywhere else, and I would record my lectures on the video. They would be screened, and then we'd get on like we are now. Uh, like we are now, and they would ask me questions. So this happened even long before COVID put an end to physical classes. And BBT has students in Korea, it has students in China, it has students in various other parts of Japan, and the majority of them, the majority are working people. They are all Shakaiji. Working people in offices. And this learning process is done by them after class, after working hours. So the answer to your question, the short answer to your question is that the process of learning virtually is something that has been in existence for a while. We are now compelled often to do it, but it's perfectly all right. Look, aren't I able to answer your question? You are able to see me, are you? Are you able to see me for whatever it's worth? Can you see my gray hair? Yes. Nicely. So you are able to see me, I'm able to see you. And we are chatting with each other. You ask my question, I try to give you a reply. So what's wrong with this kind of learning? Is it all right? Have yes, sir. thank you. Yes, sir. Thank or you. I try to divert, have I tried to divert myself and avoid your <laughs> uh, avoid it? No? Have I answered? Did you give me nine out of ten? <laughs> For my answer or not? Yes, sir. I'm asking you your assessment. Okay. Do I pass? Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> uh, so the next question is from Ishika Arya of grade seven from GIS Hadapsa. Hadapsa. Pune. Pune. Oh, in Pune. Yes. Nice to be with you. Mm -hmm. I came to that school once when you know um, our cricketer friend was there. Chandu. Yes, sir, Chandu Bodhi. Yes, I visited him there. Okay. So you were there in 1920, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I've been to your school. Tell me, what is the question? Hello, sir. I am Ishika Arya from GIIS Hadapsir Pune, and I would like to ask you, according to you, what is the future of the current education system, where both co-curricular and curricular activities are given equal amount of importance? Co-curricular and extracurricular. Yes, I'm very glad <laughs> that we given equal importance because I'm absolutely convinced without a shadow of doubt that if you do not have extracurricular activities, all work and no play will make Jack a dull boy. Dull boy. Now, I don't want you to be a dull boy too, or a dull girl. So, extracurricular activities are vital A, to give the mind a rest from book learning, following texts all the time, listening to the drone of your teacher, 
It sounds like a something when you get so you need to get out, get on the playing field, get a set of tablas, play them, sit down, do a little kota in the middle. What is a kota in the middle? Classical dance. Classical dance. And those Bharat Natyam is being taught there. Isn't it? Yes. Is it? Yes, sir. It is, yes. So is it being taught in Pune also? Is dance being taught in Pune? Yes, sir. It is um, taught. We learn Bharat Natyam in Bollywood style of dance. Wonderful. And music? music? Yes, we definitely do learn music too. We have instruments, we have yes. singing practices. Yes, yes. There's that, that wonderful line from Shakespeare, if music be the food of love, they are. So you must have music in your life. Music, and I tell you, slightly personal, my granddaughter is in university now, and her subjects are maths and music. Maths and music. I thought she'd gone a little. <laughs> but I find it is so close. And she's a composer, by the way. So her maths helps her in her composition. So the answer to your question right here, what is your name? What is her name? Ishika. 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 Is yes, extracurricular activities are vital for the development of the human brain and the human personality. Because each of these things, music, dance, good food, good drink, all of these affect different parts of your brain. So you get an all-round development of your brain and an all-round development of your personality because you're able to speak with some knowledge about music or dance or literature or yoga or any of the other extracurricular activities, judo, karate, whatever else you do, you can speak with knowledge of the about it and enjoy it. Basically, extracurricular activities, quite apart from development, are meant to be enjoyed. So enjoy them. Okay? Don't look at look upon it. As a chore, as a duty for me. Enjoy. Okay. Thank you, All sir. Right. Then, switch it on. Sir, I'd like to ask you a question on behalf of all students here. Yeah. So, in today's world, um, especially after school life, students and adults all require multiple skill, skills. Do you believe that the current school education system needs to be molded to include all these skills to be taught to students? Uh, like something, some new skills. I know that one of the subjects you're being taught here is artificial intelligence. We are right, We are taught that. No. You ask me, I don't know anything about it. But if you children learn about artificial intelligence, then I would say that you are learning a new skill. Um, I'm not sure what other new skills you're thinking about, but uh, if, if they are manual skills or mental skills, I mean, is it carpentry that you're thinking of, that you learn some carpentry, which isn't a bad thing, actually. I wonder if you would teach carpentry here. No. no. Yes, I think. Or machine tool work? No. Artwork you have, painting, surely. Mm. Yeah. These things are all important. They are old skills, but they have new methods of using the old skills now. Mm. And you can paint in a traditional way, or you can play music in a traditional way. You can do both things 
using the newest skills because all these things are developing all the time. Now, I think I may be wrong that your education here is a pretty well-rounded set of skills that you are being taught. Pretty well-rounded. And I've been to a few schools uh, in other places. And I have lectured at um, places in Moscow, in Sri Lanka, in Vietnam, all over the place, in Egypt. And I've seen schools in all these countries. And I think you're pretty well endowed here. Mm. With a well run Okay. I see this satisfaction. <laughs> in your face. I am satisfied. Yes, but you, I are, don't think you are skills. No, I'm not saying you are skilled, huh? but as you said, that every year and every time, every day, new skills are come into this world. Yes. The only way that the students can be well prepared to face these skills. And work with these skills. Right. That, you know, you have to ask your teachers. <laughs> uh, because I wouldn't be able to keep abreast with all the new skills that have been developed across the world. But um, a lot depends, you know, in your process of learning on your personal intuition. Of course, you can't teach yourself new skills because you can't cross in your studies or in your conversation or in your reading that, ah, oh, that's a new skill. That looks attractive. I'd like to learn it. Mention it to your teacher. Mention it to the teacher who teaches you artificial intelligence or whatever and see if that works. Thank you so much. All right. I definitely think about it. Okay. What else? Our next question is from Nadia Akashi, GIS Higashi Kasai Campus. Over to you, Nadia. Oh, Your Excellency Ambassador Aftab said, I'm Nadia Akashi of IGSC, IGCSE 9A. And my question to you is, due to your years of experience as an ambassador, could you please propose any tips on how we can implement diplomacy to resolve the problems we face in our daily lives? <laughs> How we can improve, how we can use diplomacy in our daily lives? So would you like to, uh, would you like me to repeat the question? I have it. Um, as, as it's um, due to your years of experience as an ambassador, could you please propose any tips on how we can implement diplomacy to resolve the problems we face in our daily lives? Ah, yes. Well, that's very good. I hope you become a diplomat, my dear, mm -hmm. when you grow up. Which, uh, are, are you Japanese or something else, some other nationality? What is your nationality? Are you, uh, which, which country? Or uh, are you Japanese? No. What is her name? I can't remember. Uh, my name yeah. is Asashi. Ah, okay. And I'm from Myanmar. So, so. You're from Myanmar? Oh, wonderful. That's even better. Um, that's a country I've been to uh, several times. So, yes, I hope you join the Myanmar Foreign Service. How you can use diplomacy in your everyday life? Uh, the answer to that is diplomacy means what? Diplomacy means the art of listening, the art of speaking. And ultimately, the art of negotiation. Because if you listen and speak, then the other person is also listening and speaking. So what you have to engage in is negotiation. And that is the essence of diplomacy. Contact building, um, being an extrovert, being good at mixing with people, these are all additional qualities that a diplomat needs. But the essential quality is that of the art of negotiation. So in your daily life, the answer to your question is, please be in a position 
to negotiate your way to problem, which means to listen to the other person, to express your opinion as frankly as you would like to, as frankly as you would dare to, and then negotiate your position to the other person or other persons who you may be listening, who, who, who you may be dealing with. That's the way of using the art of diplomacy in your everyday life. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you for answering my question. A famous um, Japanese ambassador called Akashi, who was in the United Nations for many years and head of the Koksai Bunka Kaikan, which is the International House of Japan. So you have a very distinguished name, oh, thank you. Akashi. Yeah. Tell me. So next question is very simple, but it's also quite relatable to all of us here. Yeah. Currently we have our exams going on, and although we've been acquainted with them since our very early years, we still struggle to understand how to deal with them efficiently. What tips or suggestions could you share with us regarding this? <laughs> well, let me tell you that I've been a very good exam student. I stood first in Delhi University in history honors in 1954. And because of standing first and my extracurricular activities, <laughs> I was awarded the Rhodes Scholarship to every year from India to study at Oxford. Then when I stood for the Foreign Service exam, another exam, all India, people mm -hmm. competing from all over the country, I stood second in no. the country, but first in the foreign service. No, that's exam. Exam and interview in the foreign service. And the foreign service more than life is the interview cost for everything there. Mm. So exams can be a bugbear. there. And you can say that, oh God, another damn exam is too much. Huh? But you have to acquire the technique of writing exams. Mm. And since you've been doing it from a young age, I suspect you're rather good at it by now. <laughs> Are you going to stand first? Or oh, there's no such thing anymore. In our days, it was all very competitive first, second, yes. third, fourth. Huh? Ranking up me, yeah. Up me, I'm so glad. The ranking me, it's all um, much more egalitarian. <laughs> you know that word? Egalitarian, equal. Everybody's treated in a more egalitarian fashion than in our candidates. Like a hundred meter race, you know. So anyway, um, exams shouldn't be a nowadays of course you can also look at both sides of it. No? No. By the time you look at it, you can say cheating. No. You but thrown out of the exam. But can you look at books when you're writing an exam? No. Some of the exams are considered to be are open books. Considered open books, you see, like it's unknown in our time. Unthought of. Name other? Never heard of open books in our time. So that's why you have to sharpen your memory. So the other lesson, my dear, is sharpen your memory. Hmm? So I I even now give lectures here and there, and I have to remember dates, people. I mentioned Shoto Kutaishi, the man who spread. Buddhism in Japan, Prince Regent Shoto Toku. He said, You must remember dates, you must remember the names of people, you must remember events. You must remember if you're a 
historian dates, they are horrible. It's national memory. 1858, 1868, 1893, China loses the uh, war against Japan. 1895, Japan. 1905, Japan defeats Russia. 1902 is the Anglo Japan Treaty. Now, I'm not putting uh, a rabbit out of the hat, it's not coming out of my brain. So we can attempt to remember dates of important events in your life, apart from your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> because that's when you get your presents. But you remember other important dates in your own life, in the lives of your parents, in the lives of your friends, in the life of your country, in the life of the country you're living in, and so on. Can anyone examine the country? Thank you have no problem if you sharpen on the Okay. Thank you, sir. So this, is, this will be very useful for all of us. Right. Okay. Then? So uh, we've come to the end of the questions that we've had for you. Oh, I was just enjoying myself. <laughs> okay, fine. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing with us your insightful views and for dedicating your time to grace us with your, with your opinions. This truly has been an inspirational discussion, and I'm confident that all my peers here have been listening very carefully and will have a lot to take away from the advice and experiences you shared with us today. So with that, I would like to now hand over the ceremony to the MCs. All right. Thank you, sir. No, sir. <laughs> we will take a leave, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. May I request Mr. Smith Mishra, country director of Japan, to felicitate our guests, Honorable Mr. Prabhupada Sayed, and we will also have the principal of our school, Ms. Madhu Khanna, to felicitate the chairman of BSF, Mr. Atul Kimani. I can't be understood. Uh, turn it over. क्या कर रहे हैं ये पल पलटने को बोलो इसलिए वाले हो गए वो दोनों साइड्स हैं देस अनदर नॉट Leon never and I am.
Thank you, Madhuk ma'am. Thank you, Adul sir. Thank you, Aftab sir. I request you all to please kindly take your seat. With this, we come to the end of the wonderful event of Leadership Lecture Series. On behalf of GIRS, I would like to thank Mr. Aftab Seth for taking time out of his busy schedule to share with us his interesting thoughts. I'm certain that everyone present here has a lot to take away from Sir's speech and the panel discussion. Thank you, Mr. Atul Dermanika, for gracing this occasion with your presence. We would also like to extend our gratitude to the enthusiastic panel of students, MCs, student council members, and our fellow friends who have volunteered to make this session enlightening. We thank the audience for being cooperative throughout the session. Thank you, Principal Ma'am, for giving us this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. I would also like to thank the teachers for guiding us throughout. A very big and warm thanks to all the GIS campuses who have joined us today, which are GIS Smart Campus Singapore, Hadaptar, and GIS Gashkata. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful to have all of you, all of you with us. once again and have a great day. I now request everyone to be seated as our cultural secretary, Jagati Shivasa, accompanies the guests.